Um, I'm excited to introduce our speaker tonight, Mark Romaldi. Um, we're very lucky to have him live with us tonight. Mark is a chief economist and a multiple award-winning author. His book, Retire Smart, How to Plan for a Tax-Free Retirement, won the New York City Big Book Award for the best finance book in 2019, and he has followed up with two more books that have been very well received as well. So Mark, thank you for being here tonight. Oh, Melissa, thanks for having me. And I appreciate everything you've done to put this together. And I'm so excited to be back with the Great Danes. Yeah, my pleasure. <laughs> so, you know, before you jump into things, I um, wanted to tell everybody a little bit about um, about your agency and then um, and then go ahead and, and uh, get started with the program. OK, great. Uh, as, as Melissa mentioned, we, I am a published. Yeah, you know, I am published. I do have uh, three books right now and a new one came out called uh, Retire Smart. Tonight, I'm very excited to be here, back with the great people of, of Albany State. Uh, spent some time, my, when I was in Albany State, just to connect a little, I stayed at State Quad, had a wonderful time. Still am in touch with a lot of the great people uh, that I spent you know, a good part of my college career with. Uh, still talk to them this day, I remember, I have it on my wall here that uh, our state quad won the 1985, I know I'm dating myself, the 1985 fast pitch softball league. And our team was called the Assorted Cheeses. And we still talk about it to this day. And we all had names on our back. And uh, the team gave me the mozzarella. I'm not sure if it's because I'm Italian or I just love pizza, but good times. And I'm so happy to be back. And again, thank you uh, for Melissa. Uh, for putting this together. And thanks to Joanne Valentine, who put this together. So this is going to be a lot of fun tonight. This is not going to, hopefully it's not going to be boring and I can pass along a lot of good information. It's going to be broken down into three different parts. Number one, we're going to talk about investing in this economy, the RIP economy, a recession, inflation, and petroleum. I'm going to give you my best insights in terms of investing. Uh, like Melissa said, I do, I do wear a hat as a, uh, as an investment advisor. Uh, we do have some great rankings, uh, which we'll talk about later in terms of, but again, this is not salesy. Then I need to talk about a taxes because as you grow your portfolio and as you enter retirement, really it's gonna come down to two things. How well did you invest? And how well did you manage your taxes? And at the end, a Q and A, uh, that could last as long as you as you want it to last. I love answering questions. So let's get right into the meats of this. And I'd like to talk about investing. Uh, investing today is an extremely difficult thing to do. And let me start with a story that I wrote. That's a true story that I published in my first book, Money Compass. If you took an, this is an actual situation that happened. We had an individual who had $500,000 to invest, and this individual wanted to split it between five different blue chip companies. And I'll even name the companies that this person put $100,000 in each. Citigroup, AIG, Bank of America, Ford, and GM, $500,000 divided equally between those five blue chip companies, March 1st of 20, 2004. Person doesn't look at his statements, goes away, has a great time for five years, gets back after five years, March 1st, 2009, looks at his or her statement, and they expecting to see amazing returns, five years in blue chip company. Yeah, we did have a recession, but these are blue chip companies. The brokerage statement said at the end of five years, $500,000 became $20,754, a loss of 96% sitting in five different blue chip stocks. Sounds impossible, but it actually happened. How do we make sure that doesn't happen to you as you build for retirement? We're going to talk about how to avoid that. We're going to talk about a lot of the pitfalls when investing, but that's how hard it is. You can't just pick, you know, five different blue chip companies and hope it works out. I also have a list here that most people are going to find very alarming, but also very shocking. In the year 2020 with the pandemic, there were 284 stocks 
on the exchange that became delisted. Now, fair enough, every delisted stock doesn't mean it's out of business. Twitter's now delisted and went private. However, 284 stocks delisted off the exchange. 2021, 384. This year, year to date, 304 stocks delisted. So over almost three years, 976 stocks have been delisted off the exchanges. Fascinating. It also gives you a knot in your stomach saying, what if I owned one of those stocks? Well, many of you probably did inside your mutual funds. So number one, we talked about blue chip stocks and how you, even if you allocate in blue chip stocks, you could have a problem. Number two, we, now we showed you that many stocks just become delisted. And once a stock is delisted, even if it is Twitter, which is delisted, trying to show, sell your shares of Twitter, you have to now actually go out and find somebody to buy your shares of Twitter. I'm going to show you how to avoid all that so you're not my friend here who lost a half million dollars and you're not getting a call from your broker and says, okay, one of your shares or one of your companies is now delisted. I'm going to show you how to avoid that in terms of investing. I'm also going to show you how to avoid because a lot of performance is avoidance. A lot of performance is what not to do. You know, a lot of people on this uh, webinar right now watch the news and FTX, $40 billion gone. Disappeared, gone, guys sitting in, in your overseas. So it's avoidance, you, things you have to avoid. So number one, individual stocks, I'm not a big fan of, there's better ways to do it. Number two, and I know a lot of people, as soon as I say this, are gonna say, oh no, he's talking about me. You need to avoid those target retirement funds. All three of my books, all three of them, have a chapter on the target retirement funds. What's a target retirement fund? It has a, it has a year or a date attached to it. Meaning if it's Vanguard, it could be a Vanguard target retirement, you know, 2030 or 2035. They usually go every five years. And here's the problem with those funds. And I've been writing about these funds since 2014, and the SEC is kind of trying to figure out what to do with them because of this exact problem. If you were an investor, and I don't want to pick on Melissa, but let's say Melissa's in a 401k or 403b, and she says, hey, here's a talk of retirement fund that has a year, 2025, three years out. That's, that sounds conservative. They're going to invest that with me in mind. I'm going to put some of my money in that. And most people say, hey, that's a good idea. You did, you know, it seems like it makes sense for you. Through October 31st this year, this cargo retirement fund 2025 is down 18%, almost 18%. This is a fund that's designed for somebody who's going to retire in three years. And it's down 18%. And I don't want people thinking, oh, Mark just picked a bad fund. And there's a reason for this. And this is what I've been writing about. The reason is very simple. The way these funds are managed, and they are the most common funds in America's pension plans today. Whether you have a 401k, 403b, a defined benefit plan, most of these pension plans have these retirement, target retirement funds. And I'm not picking on Vanguard. I love Vanguard. It could be a Fidelity at your price. It could be any of them. Here is the problem, and it's exploding as we speak. By prospectus, this fund needs to move from aggressive holdings to conservative holdings as you get closer to that retirement date. So in simple terms, sell stocks, buy bonds. As you get closer and closer to the retirement date, and this example is 2025. Okay, sounds logical. That's great. We have somebody watching out for me. They're getting more conservative. Well, did I just say we're getting more conservative? I did say we're getting more conservative, but are we? Is this the right time to move from stocks to bonds? As we sit here today, a long-term government bond is down over 30% for the year. Why? Because we're in inflation. We've raised rates five times this year already. We're going to raise them a few more times next year. So let's talk about that for a second. The Federal Reserve has raised rates five times. They brought the Fed funds rate, and this isn't, I'm not gonna throw a ton of numbers at you, but let's just get a picture. 
They've raised the federal funds rate from a quarter of 1%, which is almost zero, to 3%. In terms of the math, in terms of the percentage, that is huge. For example, if they raise rates from 10% to 13%, that's a 30% increase. You raise rates from a quarter percent to three, the rate, the percentage increase is astronomical. And what gets hit the hardest when you raise interest rates? The bond market. Why does the bond market get hit hard so So why does it get hit this hard? And everyone saw this coming. I wrote about this in 2014, that this is gonna happen. This is gonna happen. Not patting myself on the back, I'm just letting you know, this is what an economist does that a broker or maybe a, a CPA or not knocking anyone doesn't do. An economist looks and says, interest rates are going up, the bond market's gonna get hit hard, you need to go in different places. So. These target retirement funds did what they were said they were going to do. As we get closer to this date, we're going to get out of stocks into bonds. And they did it. The problem is, as they moved into bonds, the bond market got hammered and is getting hammered. They're going to raise rates probably two more times next year. They probably have one more increase this year in, in, in mid December. The reason being is because when new bonds are being issued at a higher rate, okay? Let me rephrase that. As new bonds are being issued, whether they're government or corporate bonds, these bonds are being issued at the current rate, which is higher. That means the bond that you own with a lower rate is worth less. Very, very basic math. If you have something that's paying 3% and the new bonds being issued are issued at five or 6%, you go to sell your bond at 3%, people aren't going to pay your full value for it. The exact opposite is when interest rates go down, the bond market goes up. So if you're holding in your pension plan or target retirement funds, please, please, please understand what you're investing in and understand that if it's going down by amounts that you, you're not comfortable with, it's not their fault. They're doing what the prospectus said. I'm not defending them. I'm just saying, by prospectus, they need to make this shift at the worst possible time. There's nothing they can do about it. So anybody who has any questions on this, please, at the end of this presentation, bring this up because there are some solutions to this in terms of these the allocations that are available. So the first thing we talked about is be careful with individual stocks. I gave you the example with the five blue chip stocks. A thousand stocks have been delisted in the last couple of years. If you're going to be in the individual stock, you need to be able to listen to this. If you're in an individual stock, and I don't care what the name of it is, you need to be able to explain to a 12-year-old why you're in it. And if you can't, sell it. It should be that obvious. It shouldn't be some Bitcoin, some complicated this, that. If it's not that obvious, if it's not obvious on the nose of you, as obvious as the nose on your face, why you're in this stock, you need to find out why you're in it. If you can't get a good answer that's that basic and that simple, you need to think about doing something with it. Target retirement funds, understand if you're in them, you're very disappointed, but now you know why you're disappointed. It's not Vanguard, T. Rowe, Price of Fidelity's fault, and it's not your fault. It's the marketing of these funds' fault. They make you think you're in a comfortable position, but when the but as your retirement comes closer and interest rates are going up, it's a double whammy. Next. I do manage a mutual fund. I'm not gonna mention its name. It does have uh, fantastic rankings. I'm gonna tell you the best investment tip I could possibly give you, bar none, okay? It's not buy and hold. Everybody's heard of buy and hold. It's not diversification. Everyone's heard of diversification. Those two things are fantastic, no question about it. Here's, here is the crux of my whole presentation. I write about it in both of my Retire Smart books, which everyone's gonna get a code at the end of this on how to get a free book, no strings attached. I write about it in both of these books. 
here's what you need to do. Let me give you a little story and you'll see where I'm going with this. It's 2020, pandemic is hitting, pandemic is here. COVID-19 has, has reached our shores. Mid-March, we shut down the economy. I have a lot of readers and a lot of clients that are very nervous. Hey, Mark, what are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? Eventually that led to questions. The, the single greatest, the single most common question I got was, Mark, they gotta come up with a vaccine. How do we profit from that vaccine? Which company's gonna come up with the vaccine? All these pharmaceutical companies, which company's gonna come up with the vaccine? My answer was the same. I have no idea. This is uncharted territory, but I do know that if we allocate your money into many different pharmaceutical companies, maybe one will hit, maybe one won't hit, maybe one will go down, I don't know. So this was my solution and this is what I've been doing for decades. Hey, now is the time to make sure we have exposure to the healthcare sector. Now I said a word there that you may not be familiar with, sectors. I, this is my lifeblood. This is what I do for my readers is I invest in, or I look at sectors. What is a sector? The, pol the politicians will probably call them industries or businesses or things like that. Economists like myself, we refer to it as a sector. There are 11 sectors that make up our economy. Our economy is a $20 trillion, $22 trillion a year economy. It is made up of 11, I don't even have 11 fingers, so I'll do 10 and one. It's made up of 11 sectors, period, that's it. We talked about almost a thousand stocks going out of business in the last three years. No, let me rephrase that, being delisted, let's be fair, just because you delisted doesn't mean you're out of business, so I wanna to be totally fair but almost a thousand stocks have been delisted. Since 1776, you know how many sectors have been delisted? Zero, none, none. They've added sectors over the years. Doesn't happen that often, but we have gone from eight to nine to 10 to 11. It doesn't happen a lot, but this is what sectors do, they evolve. So, when I got the question, Mark, how do we participate in a pharmaceutical company that comes along with the vaccine? And it turned out more than one pharmaceutical company came up with the vaccine, and that's fantastic. The answer was the same. If we invest in the healthcare sector, whatever company develops that vaccine, if they're already in the sector, will participate it. If they're not, they will get sucked into it. They will get sucked into that sector. So. Thinking big picture, uh, hopefully this makes sense in terms of what a sector does. I'll give you another great example. Five, six, seven years ago, the common question was, Mark, how do we invest in the company that's come out, gonna come out with the best electric car? Is it Tesla, is it this, is it that? My answer would always be the same. I don't have a clue. I'm not gonna sit here and tell you I'm analyzing all this stuff and battery life and this and that, no idea. However, if we invest in the automobile sector, whichever car company comes out with the best electric vehicle, it's gonna be part of the auto, automotive or transportation sector. And when we say transportation sector, 150 years ago, there were no cars in it, right? There were no cars. So everything that was in that sector has evolved over time. So how do you always have yourself in a situation where the winners, and I'm not implying that this is a foolproof method because sectors come in and out of favor and there are periods where all 11 sectors are down. I get that. What I'm saying is sectors have a way of sucking in the winners and pushing out the losers. Different than index funds. Index funds are not sectors. Index funds, which I'm a fan of, I invest in them, I love them. Index fund has different pros and cons. I'm talking about the 11 sectors that make up the economy. And I don't need to list them, but healthcare, utilities, you know, tech, things like that make up those sectors. 
So if you're investing in sectors, which there's a lot of sector fun funds that are very low cost, and I'm not marketing one, I don't have one. There's a lot of sector ETFs that are very low cost. Vanguard Fidelity have great sector ETFs that are low cost and mutual funds that are low cost. Here's what happens when you invest in a sector. The winners will shine. The losers will get pushed out. Now, what, what I'd like to say to my shareholders and to my readers is another advantage to sector investing is there's 536 people sitting in D.C. right now, House, Senate, and the president. Their job is to make sure all 11 sectors are as healthy as possible. Period. They're not looking, yeah, they do from time to time make an investment into a solar panels and things like that. And a lot of times those go bust. Those 11 sectors, when anyone says uh, the economy is the number one thing on my mind, and we just had an election. And uh, when people say the economy, what they're basically saying is those 11 sectors, that's what I'm worried about. And there's 536 people who were elected or reelected based on how well those sectors are doing. So it gives me comfort knowing there's people looking out for these sectors because if all these sectors don't perform, they will all be voted out. Can't say that about an individual stock, Amazon, Tesla, whatever you wanna say, you cannot say that. But these 11 sectors have a lot of people's jobs on the line to make sure that they're as solid as possible. So just to recap this, if you're sitting here right now and you're saying, I'm trying to picture or think of a, a scenario that's current, uh, solar panels. Mark, I want to invest in the, you know, the best solar panel company that's going to emerge over the next five to 10 years. I would say, you know what, we can invest in 20 of them, 19 can be delisted, and we can just go uh, from there, or you can just go in the energy sector. And it'll get sucked into that. Hopefully, this makes sense. In both of these books, I spend a whole chapter talking about sectors. It gives you the diversification, it gives you the liquidity. And what it also does is make sure that eventually these markets are going to bounce back. You know, we were in a recession the first half of the year, we're out of the recession, we may go back in a recession. I can tell you this, and my chief compliance officer who will review this and has approved everything I say in advance, I'm pretty confident none of these 11 sectors are gonna go out of business. None of these 11 sectors are gonna be like this Bitcoin thing that 46 billion disappeared or Enron or it goes on and on and on and on. So just keep that in mind. Uh, so just to recap a little about investing. Number one, I didn't say this, but I'm gonna say this now. Try to avoid this is gonna sound a little funky, but I have decades of experience here. Try to avoid investing in optimists. Mark, that makes no sense. It makes perfect sense and I'll tell you why. The S&P 500 consists of 500 companies, large companies. The S&P 500 has 500 CEOs. If I called all 500 CEOs, by the end of each call, I would be totally convinced that their company is the company I need to put my life savings in. They are all optimists. It's perfect timing, Mark. We're about to do this, Mark. Everything's going great, Mark. We got wind in our back, Mark. They are going to tell me every reason to invest in that company. And I'm going to hang up the phone saying, I need to invest in all 500 of these companies. Well, very, very few of these companies are going to pan out. A very famous person once said, pessimists are made by investing in optimists. Great example of what's going on at FTX. Gone. This guy just and him and his staff just running around the world raising billions of dollars on a promise. He was an optimist. This is going to happen. That's going to happen. It, none of it happened. So be very careful who you talk to and be very careful of the optimist because you know what? If things were that good for that company, 
and these I see these radio and TV commercials, invest in this, invest in that, you know, you know, whether it's an annuity, whether it's real estate, you know, if these take a real, I see a lot of commercials lately and I feel bad about, you know, invest in real estate, you get this return, blah, 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 blah. If they were really producing these returns, they would just go to a bank, present this to a bank. The bank would say, fine, I'll lend you all the money you need for these returns, period. They have done that and the bank has looked at it and said, no, nope, sorry, too risky for us. So be very careful about investing in optimists. So individual stocks, if you cannot explain to a 12 year old why you're in it, you, be, you need to learn why you're in it. That's number one. Number two, if you're in these target retirement funds, you need to understand what they're meant to do. And this is certainly not a time where you wanna be moving money into bond market. Bond market has gotten hammered and it's gonna to continue to get hammered. Number three, understand sectors. Fidelity and I aren't in business together, so I'll say Fidelity. Fidelity does a great job on their site every day showing you what all 11 sectors are doing. It's a fantastic website. I have no reason to say it other than it's good and understand what a sector does. It's, I can't, I hate saying the word never, but we've never had a sector go out of business. It just evolves based on the current economy. Let's talk inflation and sectors. You know, there's a utility sector. Utilities are affected by inflation. Utilities are one of the best sectors. The three best sectors this year has been energy, utilities, consumer staples. In a recession, does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense because whether you're in a recession or not, you still need gas and oil. And things that happened in DC made gas less available, which drove the price up, which helped the energy sector. Number two, utilities. Again, Totally makes sense. In a recession, you still need your utilities. And what was the third best sector so far this year? Consumer staples. Consumer staples are things you just need to buy every day. That's whether, you know, just your everyday items, bread, milk, food, you know, stuff like that. Why? Why do they, they do better in the recession? Because those are the things that we need to buy first. We need to heat our house. We need to put our lights on and we need our everyday items. Now, this isn't, you know, hey, Johnny, come lately. Of course, Mark's saying this now because of where we are. When you read my book, you'll see I was right. I, this book that came out this year, not patting myself on the back, but it tells you what to do in all different economies. Now, as we come out of the recession, which we will, and we will have another bull market, the stock markets don't go down forever, don't go up forever, other parts of the, the other sectors are going to evolve. And again, like Melissa very kindly said, there is going to be a Q&A. If you have questions, please. I love answering questions. But now let's talk about something just as important to your everyday life and your retirement. And that's the dreaded T word. Excuse me, I just need to, a little water. If that was unprofessional, I apologize. But I'm an economist. I'm not <laughs> an actor, but I do act to play one on TV. Let's talk about taxes. Oh God, I could talk about taxes all day. So we talked about all those stocks that got delisted. Well, that's a tax loss. We talked about, you know, uh, how to invest in, in sectors. Well, that could be a tax gain. I have it down to three simple codes or three simple tax codes that the rich use every day that we need to start using. I am not a CPA. I'm not holding myself out as a CPA. However, in both of my books, CPAs have verified what I'm about to tell you. Now, when I say both of my books, this book, Retire Smart, is available. Everyone's gonna get a copy, to anyone who wants one. This one, the first one is good if you're in retirement or close to retirement, or you have a 401k, 403b, to help you manage those accounts. If you're in what we call the gig economy, which means you have that three or four jobs to make ends meet and you don't have a typical pension plan, this will show you how to build your own pension plan. And again, free of charge, this is not sales. So let's talk about taxes. 
Taxes have a huge impact on your retirement and your everyday life. We all want to pay less taxes. I'm going to show you exactly what Warren Buffett does on his tax return. This is why he said on multiple occasions, my secretary is in a higher tax bracket than I am. I'm going to tell you why. Number one, standard deduction. Everyone who files a tax return gets a standard deduction of this year. It changes you know, every year. For 2022, we have a standard deduction of $12,950. Standard deduction sounds like a fancy term. All it means is the first $12,950 that I earn, you earn, Melissa earns, is 100% tax-free on a federal level. 100%. We are all dealing with the same IRS. So if this year my W-2 said $12,950 and I was filing an individual return, my federal taxes would be zero. Problem is, most of us aren't taking advantage of that. Book shows you how to take advantage of that standard deduction. Today and in retirement. See. We were all told in terms of a pension plan, invest in your pension plan, get a tax deduction, have it grow, and when you retire, you'll be in a lower tax bracket. Well, I've been in this business for decades. I'm waiting to meet the first person who said, Mark, I'm retired now. I'm in a lower tax bracket. None of us are. With $30 trillion in debt, taxes are going up. So we all get this standard deduction that we could use when we're working and retirement. You just have to know how to use it. Number two, and probably the most important thing, the two most important things I'm talking about tonight are sectors and this next item, capital gains. What a capital gain tax is, if you bought something at X and you sold it at Y, you have a gain on your capital and that's taxed. Sounds simple. Here's the good news. The tax rate for most Americans is zero. I have a printout from the IRS right now from the IRS.gov that I printed out today. If you're single and making $40,000 a year or less, a long-term capital gain, now let's just talk about this. There's two different types of capital gains, long and short-term. A year or less short-term capital gain, it's taxed as income. A year or more capital gain, long-term capital gain, get the tax benefits. According to irs.gov, you earn $40,400 as an individual. Your capital gain rate, ready? Zero, zero, zero. Married couple, it's 40,400 times two, 80,000. Zero. Your income tax bracket at that, at that salary is 12%. Still low, but it's not zero. Are you ready for this? Long-term capital gain, the secret to keeping your wealth. If you earn between 40,000, and I'm sorry I keep looking at my notes. You know, I went to, to, uh, I went to uh, Albany in 1985, so that dates me a little. So by memory, I need to have my notes here. So I hope you guys understand that. And hopefully you get to my point where you'll need these notes too. But if you earn between 40,000 and 440,000, huge gap. I mean, we're talking close to the top 1%. You have a long term capital gain? 15. Oops, sorry about that. I'm back. Okay, sorry about that. I hit the mouse. My bad. 40,000 to 400,000, you have a long-term capital gain, tax rate, 15%, 1.5, The income bracket there is, is 28%. So how do we get our gains taxed at this amazing tax rate, okay? Because here's the problem. I just told you how great capital gains are. If you have a pension plan right now, 
a company sponsored pension plan, a 401k, a 403b, you know, anything like that. Something happens in times inside that pension plan that's going to make you very, very upset. It's going to make you very sad because it makes me sad whenever I have to tell people this. Something happens inside that pension plan. It magically converts capital gains to income. So it magically converts something that could be zero taxes or could be as low as 15% and converts it to income when you take the money out. This drives me nuts. We were never told this when we started our careers. We were never, we haven't been told this now that if you have an investment inside your pension plan and it grows, which most of us do, it, whether it's a mutual fund, an ETF, a stock, it grows, you sell it. Outside the 401k or outside the pension plan, capital gain, capital gain rate. Inside, the money stays in there, the realized gain stays in there. When you pull it out, you get your 1099R, it's taxed as income. They can't tell the difference. I cannot tell you how many uh, leaders I've talked to to say, listen, you need to somehow figure out how to make a distribution out of a pension plan show whether that was income or capital gains. Because now we were just told, put your money in, it'll grow tax deferred when you pull it out in the lower tax bracket. Well, you know, it's still, <laughs> but it's converting a tax-free event into a taxable event before your eyes. And you don't even know about it. Nobody's ever told you about it. Because you know what? They probably don't know themselves. This has been, I've been on a mission to try and get the powers that be, and I'm just a little, you know, a little economist, I don't have power, to understand that this isn't right. This, is, this certainly isn't fair. Because most people's investments in their pension plans are in the markets and have, other than this year, have appreciated, and that appreciation is a capital gain. And they're not taking advantage of the capital gain rate because they can't, because the pension plan by design took that option away from them and made it all income. When you pull money out of your retirement plan, you get a nice little 1099R the following January, and it's all added to your income. It's not a capital gain. What do you do about this? Well, I can't answer that on a call like this. I can answer it maybe in a chat or something like that because it's a very complicated issue. But Taxes are very, very, very important. So number one, you need to take advantage of your standard deduction. And number two, you need to know how to start growing your money to take advantage of the capital gains rate that Warren Buffett, Jeff Bezos, and all the rich people do. And then there's the third component that's even worse, step up in basis. If I have a 401k and because again, according to the IRS, when they see your pension plan, all as they see, all the IRS sees is wages you haven't paid taxes on. That's what it is to them. Whether it's $10,000, quarter million, 300,000, they look at that and say, hey, there's wages that I haven't paid taxes on. So when money comes out, it's considered wages as if you earned it that year. By the way, according to Fidelity Investments, $4 trillion in, in pension plan money has evaporated this year because of the markets. $4 trillion. That makes me encouraged. Why does it make me encouraged? Because the 536 people in Washington who banked on getting taxes off that $4 trillion are going to fix these sectors and make sure the money comes back. Mark my words, it may take a year or two, but when they get all these sectors fixed and that money comes back, you heard it here first, not stocks. Uh, so what I, what I was saying is the step up in basis. If you have a 401k or a pension plan and God forbid you pass away, your beneficiary is going to inherit that full account. Yes, there are some benefit, you know, uh, hereditary IRAs. There's some little things that can slow down the distribution. But when it's all said and done, it's all going to come out. It's all going to be taxed as income. If you had the same amount of money invested the way I show you how to invest it, there's something called the step up in basis. The step up in basis is very simple. 
if your own money in this, let's just say your own money in this account was $200,000 and by the time you passed, it grew to 500,000 to say that. So there's $300,000 in there that's never been taxed. If that was a 401k, it would all be taxed. Outside of 401k in a tax managed account, you get a step up in basis, meaning your heirs now in their new basis is the date of death value, meaning pass it to them tax free. You know, there's a joke in the industry, you know, how do you, how do you keep wealth uh, in, in your pocket? And the joke is, you know, just keep getting married and keep passing it on to your, to your new spouse. But the real way to do it is have a tax managed account and make sure that your taxes are kept to a minimum. I understand that most of the, excuse me, most of this probably sounds very, very complicated. Please don't take that as I don't think you are smart enough to handle it. I'm sure most of the people on this call, if not all of them, had a higher GPA than I did when I was in Albany State. Uh, but I just happen to understand this. So when it comes to taxes, you need to make sure you're taking advantage of your standard deduction. It's one of the few gifts the IRS gives you in your working years and retirement. Take advantage of both. You need to have your wealth grow with capital gains because that's the lowest tax bracket. Family making $80,000 or less, long-term capital gains, zero, 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 zero. And you need to make sure that you have a step up in basis. Now I understand that may be less important. Hey Mark, you know, it means I'm deceased. I'm not worried about it, but you know what? If you pass it on to your spouse or your kids, why are you pass on this tax burden when you don't need to? Uh, these are the things uh, that you need to look at, especially during a recession. Now, I did mention that we're gonna talk about inflation and how to beat inflation. I told you that when inflation comes, the bond market gets hit hard, except for one sector of the bond market. Are you ready? The government issues what they call iShares, inflation protected bonds. They are only issued by the US government and they are only issued to individuals. Not corporations, not mutual funds, they are only issued to individuals. Before this call started, I just looked on it and the yield on it, it pays two different types. It pays a fixed income and then it pays another part that's adjusted for inflation. According to the IRS site uh, for I bonds, it's 6.89%, which is incredibly high. It's a government bond. And you look at the bond market getting hammered. You can only buy them directly from the government. So it's something to look at that you probably haven't heard about. There's not, for some reason, I don't know why. Well, I think I know why nobody's talking about it because brokers don't want to sell it to you and advisors don't want to sell it to you because there's no money in it for them. But they're called inflation protected bonds. Now, please, please, please don't be confused between an I bond, which is an individual bond that you get directly from the government and an inflation protected fund or ETF, completely two different animals. So if you go on your computer and type in inflation protected bond for T. Rowe Price, that's not what I'm talking about. It needs to be through the government. So, uh, Melissa, if you wanna hit me with some questions, hopefully I covered enough. Uh, like I said, I love doing this. I love talking about it. So we talked about some investing tips. We talked about taxes, I bonds, uh, sectors. So hopefully uh, we hit on some topics that are very uh, timely. Yeah, I think so. I mean, you covered quite a bit in 40 minutes. I'm sure you gave a lot of us uh, something to think about. And we, we do have some questions. So um, we'll get started. Um, Alan asks, what about blue chips that have a long history of consistently paying dividends every quarter and raise the dividend rate every year combined with the dividend reinvestments? Well, Alan, what I'm going to say to you is this. Go back to my first story. Citigroup falls into that category. Long history of dividends out of business. AIG decades, long history of dividends, dividend reinvestment, out of business. Bank of America, out of business. GM went bankrupt, Ford went bankrupt. So 
I, it makes sense. I understand what you're saying. There's a lot of good blue chip companies, but I gave you a story about five blue chip companies that basically became worthless. Uh, so you do need to watch out about that. Maybe you can put in some stop losses in case the market goes down. Uh, with any individual stock, anything could happen. Dividends is certainly a great way to play it because what a dividend does, a dividend proves this, which is vitally important. It proves the company has cash flow because that's where the dividend's coming. So Alan, I think you definitely hit a good topic there. I think you're on the right path, but just keep in mind, I mentioned five blue chip companies with great yields, great dividends that just went boom. So it, diversify with that by putting some sectors around that and you can have those dividends as, you, as, you, as your core. But remember what I said, the most important thing is dividends prove that the company has cash flow, which is always good. Okay. All right, great. Um, another question. Um, do you think that the next generation and the next generation will pay for national debt? Also, do you think there's, um, do you anticipate there's any ceiling? Okay, do I think the next generation is going to pay for the national debt with $30 trillion in debt? $30 trillion as a company, as a country. Again, I'm an economist. I have no political dog in the fight. I don't care who's in DC. I don't care who has control. My job as an economist is to look at their agenda and try to put my client's money in front of it. Here's what I think is going to happen. We, we cannot pay back $30 trillion. It's impossible. Rates going up, meaning Social Security benefits, January 1st, Melissa's going up 8% for everybody. Maybe it's 8.6%. The government didn't count on that the last few years. So every Social Security check that they write in 2023 is going to be 8% more. I mean, in 2022, it's going to be 8% more. Where's that money coming from? To support the debt, now we're issuing more bonds at a much higher rate. Where's that money going to come from? I don't think we'll ever pay back the $30 trillion. Here's what I think is going to happen. And again, this is just one person's, account, one person's uh, opinion. Either A, we default on it. B, we raise taxes to the point where we pay it off. Or C, we default on some of it. And here's the secret sauce, okay? I'm going to give you some inside baseball here. And if I'm answering this question long-winded, it's important that you understand this. I mentioned $30 trillion in debt. Typically, that would cause silver and gold to go through the roof. It hasn't. I'm going to tell you why. Because here's a secret. Is everybody listening? We're not $30 trillion in debt. Right, Mark? You just said it four times. We're $30 trillion in debt. Now you're saying we're not. I'm going to tell you why we're not. The Fed has a balance sheet. The Federal Reserve has a balance sheet on it of about, let's use round numbers, $8 trillion. $8 trillion the Federal Reserve has that they borrowed from the Treasury. Melissa, if you have a note in your right pocket that says, I owe Melissa $20, okay, do you ever have to pay yourself back or can you just rip the note up? You can just rip it up. Well, I don't have to pay myself back. This $8 trillion in the Federal Reserve books is money that they borrowed from themselves. Oh. So we're really $22 trillion in debt. That's the good news, but nobody wants to talk about that. They talk about balancing this balance sheet and letting the bonds run off and all this. The reason gold and silver haven't spiked the way it should is because we're not really $22 trillion in debt, 2030. We have the money on the books at the Fed. And I know this is a long-winded answer, but you need to understand that when they did this qualifying, uh, quantify the QE, when they raised money after the Great Recession, the Fed took money from the Treasury. They don't have to pay it back. They don't have to pay interest on it. They don't have to do anything. It's, it's a, it's a, I don't want to use the P word, Ponzi, but the whole thing was crazy. It was Bernanke's idea. I think Ben Bernanke was a genius. Now they're trying to unwind it. What I mean is unwind it is the eight, trillion dollars that the federal reserve has on bonds that were issued by the treasury the neighbors they're just going to let them mature now melissa when this bond matures they're not going to go to the treasury and get the money it's just going to evaporate it's just going to evaporate so to answer your question directly do i think the next generation is going to inherit this yes but i think there's going to come a time where people are going to realize that 
there's eight trillion dollars we don't owe, and I think they're going to eventually default. They're going to we're going to have to face a default because we'll never pay it back. Okay. All right. Well, we'll see how it happens with that prediction. Now that was just a small end. I could have expanded that, but we'll just keep it at that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I know you could probably talk for an hour on all these topics, but all right. Matt S wants to know how much is the Russian war impacting inflation? I don't have a dog in the fight. Inflation right now, 7.7%, Matt. It's a great question. It's down a little. You heard it here first when inflation is going to be a much less issue. When we get to March and April next year, remember what I said, inflation is probably going to be below six. But to end, how much is it impacted inflation? It's 7.7 .7 now. If we, if we didn't have energy spiking, I mentioned the energy sector being the best sector. If we didn't have that spiking, it might be 6%, it might be 6.5%. It has had an impact. Uh, it's not the sole reason. The sole reason is from 20 to 22, we spent $7 trillion as a government. That's the sole reason, uh, but it has a small impact, uh, but I don't think it's the sole cause. Just it's minor. It's minor. Minor. Okay. All right. Just a couple of questions left. Um, what do you think should be consumers' priorities with regard to their various debt holdings as the economic situation changes? I know a lot of people say pay your highest credit card or debt off first, you know, and that's obviously, you know, it's a common sense kind of answer, but I want to go further than that because people on this call are smarter than just getting common sense answers. You know, pay your highest one. You also need to stop adding to the debt. So in terms of your debt, obviously, you need to pay your highest interest rates first. But here's a cardinal rule that you need to live by, and you need to live by it as soon as you possibly can. Never, 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 never put a want on your credit card, ever. There's, there is good debt and there's bad debt. If you have a need, food, shelter, a car repair, and the only place you can put it is in a credit card, hey, God, that's great. Try to never put a want on a credit card because it will come back to, to bite you. Uh, interest rates are going up, so the faster you can pay off the debt, the better. You know, this is, this is I know, realize we have a generation that has never experienced interest rates this high. Melissa, I think a 30-year mortgage is 7%. There was a point where I thought that was a bargain. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the last 15 years, mortgages are 2 3 4%. So the younger generation, which I feel bad for, I'm, I'm a baby boomer. Mm -hmm. And boy, did we really stick it to the younger generation. I'll be the first to tell you. Interest rates are just going higher and higher. So the faster you can pay off your debt, the better. Pay off the revolving debt as fast as possible. Okay. All right, last question. What global trends will shape the world economy in the next 10 years? Big picture question mark. Okay, what global trends? It's it's gonna be, I can't narrow it down to one, so I'm gonna narrow it down to two. Energy, which I know is obvious, but water. How do we get fresh water to 8 billion people? Dean, uh, not Dean Kane, Dean Kamen. Dean Kamen, who invented the Segway, the dialysis machine. He is working on a system right now to get fresh water out of unfresh water. And he's putting a lot of money into it. I think that's the crisis for the next generation. Yeah, we want to, you know, obviously we want to keep emissions down and we want to do all that great stuff and that's great. But getting fresh water to 8 billion people is the number one crisis. Nestle has the uh, stranglehold on all these bottled waters. You look at bottled water, read on it, no matter what it says, eventually go down to Nestle, they're a French company. I personally think the person who can get fresh water to the masses is gonna be the new richest person in the world. I'm more concerned about fresh water to the masses than anything else. So Mark, thank you so much. Um, good night to everybody. Hope you all uh, have a great evening. Thank you, Thanks, Melissa, and hope everybody has a great Thanksgiving.